It is a, a pleasure to have such a, a, a wonderful crowd here uh, today. And what we're talking about today is we're continuing the theme of uh, IP architecture. In this case, we're going to delve a little bit into IP architecture for production, when production could be defined as the studio environment, be defined as uh, multiple uh, buildings that you may have to connect to. It can even be defined as remote production. So this is continuing the theme that we really dove into at the TTC meetings that we had last June, where Paul and, and Lee really took us on a a great uh, dive into uh, 2110 in particular, uh, but we're going to expand on that uh, a little bit uh, today. Now we have three speakers who are going to be up, and we're going to ask each speaker to come up and make a presentation, and we'll ask the audience to hold your questions, because at the very end what we'll do is have all three of those presenters come up, uh, and then you can ask uh, your, your questions and have all three uh, answer, and maybe debate, maybe look, they can get into some uh, healthy arguments, and that'll be uh, quite interesting. So our first speaker tonight is Gord Langdon. Now, Gord is a video applications engineer for Tektronic uh, Canada. Uh, Gord joined Tektronic in early 2015. He has only over 30 years experience in the industry with Imagineering, uh, Rogers Cable, and Capella Telecom. Rogers is, is, Gord is a, is a member of uh, Simply Toronto, SETD Ontario chapter, and Professional Engineers of Ontario. Gord. is going through a lot of change right now, probably more in different areas than we've ever seen in, in decades, maybe. When you've got a lot of change, you have to learn the new standards, you have to learn about the tricks, and that's not just from a textbook or from a website. You have to spend time with people and talking to each other, like we are here tonight. Okay, the cameras. Thank you, Peter. Okay. When you have change, you need to learn things, you need to figure out what tools you're going to use, you need to figure out how am I going to use this, what things am I going to need, and how am I going to fix things when they go wrong. Because the ultimate goal is to produce a good quality product for our customers, and quality has a, a sort of a, a subtle definition here. There's two concepts, quality of service, which talks about the quality and the content of the pipe, the condition of the pipes, the network, and then there's the quality of experience, which is what the end customer perceives about your service. Is it good, bad, or somewhere in between? And QoS, for short, and QoE apply to all the things we're talking about here and the changes that we're going through. Some of the things of, of related to QoE would be things like video tiling or macro blocking, blurring, bad splices, as in this example on the, the bottom right, crashing from one scene into the next, audio loudness problems, dynamic range problems, lip sync, which has been around as a bane of our industry for decades. And in the modern era, when we have over-the-top or adaptive bitrate delivery, we're looking at slow acquisition times or rebuffering that's frequent and really annoys customers. I'm going to go back about 25 years ago because there is some commonality here. Transport streams. This is where we started. 25 years ago, there was the transition from analog to digital TV. And we certainly could love that. That was difficult enough. But once we had productions that were, say, 270 megabits per second for SD, SDI, and then eventually 1.5 gigabits for HD, SDI, how do you get that out of your facility? It's great in a little closed environment. You have to deliver it to the home. You cannot deliver those bit rates to the home. Well, almost now. So we came up with a thing called the MPEG transport stream in the mid-90s. And it was designed for transmission, of course, but also for file storage and video on demand. What it did was compress that, those high bit rates by taking out redundant information or it, finding a way to encode it into a smaller bit rate. We created elementary streams for video, for audio, and for all the data and other things that needed to go with that. We took those elementary streams and multiplexed them into the familiar 188-byte MPEG-2 packet for a transport stream. We also had to convey system timing. The MPEG encoder uses a 27 megahertz clock. We had to find a way to 
slip that information into the data stream so that the decoder at the other end would be able to reproduce the pictures and the audio. We had to include little, little tricks like a, a sync byte pattern so that we could find the start of packets in a long bit stream. And we had to include some timestamps as well. Then we had to encapsulate that transport stream for transmission. Many of you from years ago will remember a DS3 as a very common telecom data link that you could buy as a circuit. There was ASI. ASI is still around, not too much anymore. Satellite had uh, you know, various standards. When we went to digital over-the-air television, that's 8VSB modulation. But more and more, transmission is becoming IP-based. And in particular, I've highlighted in red UDP, User Datagram Protocol, because it's a connectionless packetization. The, you send it out there, and good luck if it gets to the other end. There are some error correction schemes to make it work, but essentially, it's just hope and, and pray that it gets to the other side. MPEG uses a thing called the leaky bucket model for buffer management. You don't want it to fill or drain too fast or too slow. We had quality of service standards that emerged for that. DVB and Etsy created the TR101-290 spec back in the mid-90s, and it was meant to measure the output of equipment fundamentally, uh, not over the end-to-end -end link, like over a satellite link or something. Because of that, the specs are tight, and as you see, it's a red light or a green light, go or no go. And it was never intended to be used for end-to-end -end transport links. More in the 2000s, both ATSC and SCTE came up with better range of standards for this. So example, SCUDI 142 or, or A78 standard. These were five categories. They're very practical. My transport stream's off the air. Big trouble. All the way down to, it's technically non-conformant. Eh, maybe the decoder won't even notice it. And you'll see there's sort of a pattern there. There was uh, under 100 milliseconds, for example, you're OK. And it was a factor of two, and then you're not so OK. And a factor of five, boy, you're in trouble. So these were very practical standards. We also had a thing called Media Delivery Index, exclusively for IP transport of MPEG. It was it applied to other factors as well. But in our industry, this is what MDI meant. And it was a measure of the jitter of your IP network. Didn't matter if the stuff inside the IP packets was good or bad, just the jitter was bad. So what else can go wrong? Quality of service does not mean quality of experience is good. It could be, but it doesn't always. Take, for example, if I lose a packet and it happens to be on an iframe, an intracoded frame, which is the entire raster like a JPEG, it could hit right in the point where if I have a long group of pictures, let's say 32 to 64 uh, GOP length, that will cause an outage for probably two or more seconds because you have no anchor content there. On the other hand, it might be just one packet that drops out in a B frame and your decoder could, de could conceal that or you wouldn't even notice it if you were really watching closely. Also, if, if the packet hits right in the middle of the news anchor's face and you get a green block there, boy, that's going to be noticeable. And if it happens off to the corner of the screen, you probably wouldn't even see it. If the compression quality, for example, was too blocky because you starved the encoder for bits, or if it was too soft because you softened the, the edges, that's still legal, but it doesn't necessarily look good to the customer. Maybe it's a bad splice like this example, and the usual audio problems too. The reason I gave you that backgrounder is that we're doing the same kind of packetized thing for professional media over managed IP networks. It's a big mouthful. P. Moment doesn't sort of roll off the tongue as a good acronym. So we tend to say IP video. But let's make sure we know the distinction between MPEG type transport stream for compressed media and uncompressed or lightly compressed uh, for production use. Two standards, SMPTE 2022 family and 2110 suite. I'll describe the differences between them. 2022-6. Audio video and the metadata essences plus precision time protocol are all lumped together in a transport stream, like, a, like the freight train uh, with boxcars behind it. The problem with it is if you want to break out the audio or you want to have two different languages, French and English, 
but you, you don't want to waste the, the repeat of the same video, for example, you need to uh, demux or unbundle the audio just to do that kind of thing. So it's suited for playout and distribution workflows, similar to transport stream. We had to get it out of the building. Each packet has a unique RTP, real-time transport protocol, timestamp and sequence number. This means that every packet can be identified. You know exactly which one is lost or missing, unlike MPEG transport where you just throw some stuff out there and hope the packets get to the other end. You could actually ask for a resend. In contrast, SMPTE 2110 is intended for production workflows. Each essence, video, audio, and metadata is independent and it's only held together with a precision time protocol. In fact, we don't even send the vertical and horizontal blanking information in the video payload. It's separate. It's in with the metadata. And distinctively, all packets of a given video frame share the same RTP timestamp. So that's kind of interesting. You can identify that this audio goes with this video, for example. You see dash 7 here. Dash 7 is just a companion to that. Dash 7, in, in essence, means we've got another path for redundancy, an A and a B path. And the timing, when you consider having two paths, it has to be very precise because we're not just talking about a fiber cut on one path. We're taking the idea that you could switch between each path at any time for any given packet and put the, together a reassembled transport stream. I encourage you to go to the SMPTE website and look under publications and wall charts because there's two really amazing posters that you should get printed out at the local uh, staples and put them up on your cubicle wall because they are really good. One thing I will go through here today is little gotchas. One of them is the RTP payload types. The standard talks about a range of values possible for any one of the essences, anywhere from 96 to 127. But the problem is it's so wide open that you get one vendor doing it one way and you get another vendor doing it a different way. So the industry has had to come up through the, the interop, the dirty hands uh, work that uh, Lee mentioned, with some standardized values that we can use as a de facto uh, rule. 98 for 2022-6 uh, uh, transport. Uh, 2110 video is 96, audio is 97, the data is 100. It doesn't have to be that way, just that if you all play with the same rules, everything works better. What are the media challenges, the Pimoman IP media challenges? The worst one for me, I think, is IP address management. Every port, every link, every device has a host address, maybe both for the media ports and for a control port that's out of band. <laughs> You've got multicast streams for each one of those essences. You've got multicast port. It's management by spreadsheet or death by spreadsheet, I think, say. What if you get a rogue device? You, somebody didn't configure it properly or, as I do, often type it wrong on, when I'm entering information. Suddenly it shows up live on your network and it's in conflict with another address already there. Have to worry about traffic management. We're talking jitter once again, oversubscription of links. There's a bad one. I think Drew's got some anecdotes about that later. <laughs> Asynchronous paths. SDI was a unidirectional protocol. Plug it in this, in this end, it comes out the other end, you can look at it. It doesn't work that way in IP fabric. You could have paths that are back and forth. In fact, the delay might be different in one direction versus the other. You might have to have some traffic control policies in your, your switch fabric. And precision time protocol itself is a very difficult topic. There are many more things. It's way more complicated than black burst or tri-level sync. And it's in band, usually, with the rest of the essence packets. It's not like having a black burst cable that you plug in on the back of your, your box now. So let's talk about some of the basic networking stuff. Before you connect something to your network, check it out. Make sure it's got the right source address, destination multicast, and the ports. Make sure it's the right protocol. You think it was 2110, but it's the wrong protocol. Bit rates. Make sure it looks normal. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of small, but remember in 2110-20 video, you don't send the vertical and horizontal ants data. So the payload is actually smaller. Instead of having 1.5 gigabits expected value for your HDSDI, this would be 1.311 uh, 
uh, gigabits, a little bit smaller. So if you can see it right away, you'll always say, ah, that's a 2110 video, yeah. Stay, old, stay under the limit. Let's say you have a 10 gigabit interface or a link or a 25 gigabit interface or link. Just because it says 25 doesn't mean you can come that close. You have to have a little bit of wiggle room below that to stay legal. And what will happen if you get too close to that limit? Will the packets get dropped randomly? Will the equipment suddenly just stop and put out a red light? What's going to happen? These are the unknowns. A new concept that we haven't seen before, if you're familiar with using a scope or any kind of real-time tool, you expect that time is on the x-axis usually. In, that, in this case, we've got a lot of data to deal with. And in fact, a better representation of that is a packet interarrival time histogram. It's a long word to say, so you call it a PIT histogram. This is a probabilistic view of when packets will arrive. Burst events that happen too soon or too late might get dropped out of the buffer, the leaky, buff, the leaky bucket model. What are the thresholds? Some of the stuff's in the specs, some of it's not. Some of it's vendor dependent. I bet we're going to have similar QoS standards that'll come out in the next few years that'll address many of these things. Right now it's wild times. Let's focus a little bit on traffic and buffer management. 2022-6 does have a, have a new measurement. It's called a timestamp delay factor. Remember I talked about MDI for IP jitter in transport networks? Well, this is a better version because it looks at the RTP headers and the timestamps in those headers. It's a one second moving window that gives you an idea of how jittery your, your network is. If we have dash seven where there's a, another path, it's kind of nice to look at a histogram for each of those paths and say, oh, I think they're closely aligned. They're not, one's not spread out too wide and it's not too different from the other path. And there is a spec for this. You know, it's kind of complicated. This is an eye diagram, sort of. If you're taking transport from, say, one rack to the next rack or even the next room, that's a short haul link. And there's some specs for that, like under 10 milliseconds for high bitrate streams. If you're taking a medium haul or a short haul link, say, from this building to the building next door or another floor in the, in the tower, that's a moderate skew with a little bit more delay requirements. And if I'm trying to send something from here to Montreal or from here to Vancouver, that's definitely a long haul, high skew link. And it has an associated longer path differential allowance. And that means longer latency. How long can it be? If you're doing live sports or some election result, long skew is not going to be a, your friend here. I don't know what you can do about it, though. SMPTE 2110 has a, a, a separate standard uh, document just for traffic and buffer management and it describes some video timing models. Remember we don't send the horizontal and, and vertical ancillary data. What are you going to do during that time? There's no video, no active video. It's called gapped mode. You just stay silent. You don't send anything. On the other hand, another option is having a linear model of packets. You send packets evenly spaced all the time, even when there is no active video that present. So you have to buffer that stuff. Furthermore, there are wide and narrow senders. Senders is just any kind of device that's sending out data. It could be a receiver at the same time, in fact. If it's a hardware-based implementation, chances are that it's got special network uh, interfaces that have low latency and all those things, and it's purpose-built. So we call that a narrow sender. In contrast, let's say you put up a workflow that's on a generic server. Maybe it's in the cloud or on-premise somewhere else. It's just running on a generic PC. It's going to have more processes going on and greater chances of interruption. So we have a wide model for that. We're going to get to, to know these things like signatures almost. There's an example on the upper left of a narrow gapped model. You see it's a very tight sort of spike, meaning not very much jitter. And there's some of the packets related to the, uh, you know, the, the gapped model. We have on the, the right side there, a narrow linear one where it's pretty much mostly probable it's the spike in the center, but there's a little bit of jitter because down low means less probable. The, the taller the spike, the more probable it is for that time in that place. And then there's a wide linear, it's spread all over the place there. 
SMPTE 2110 set senders have to obey a couple of things. One is a network compatibility model, and the other one is what it thinks is going to be the receiver that's dealing with the, the stuff. Once again, the leaky bucket model says that as a sender, I have to, to define and communicate that I have a maximum number of so many packets in my buffer model, and I'm trying to keep below that at any instantaneous moment. Not underflows, not overflows. So that's C max and C instantaneous. Knowing that the receive is going to be, say, a wide or a narrow receiver, it's going to have different parameters that it's going to target. So it's going to have to obey a virtual receive buffer. And of course, you don't want your C max on the sender side to be um, less than uh, your, your uh, if I got that right? Yeah. The receive buffer has to be bigger than the transmit buffer to, for it to work legally. And you can see there's a little jitter, but generally it's pretty, pretty stable. There are some specs for this. For example, a narrow sender uh, doing a gapped profile has to keep four packets CMAX, eight packets virtual receive buffer, and that's about two lines of data for a 1920 by 1080 raster. If it's a wide model, it's 16 packets from the sender's side, and the receiver could be up to, say, 720 packets in its buffer. That's almost 20% of the, the whole frame. I mentioned PTP, precision time protocol, is complicated. Well, there is also a 2110 standard called the system spec-10, and SMPTE 2059 is precision time protocol. So let's jump into that. The ultimate source of time for all this stuff is an atomic clock in a GPS satellite up there. That comes down usually to a local clock that syncs up to that and delivers PTP. That PTP has to be split out into a 90 kilohertz clock for video and a 48 kilohertz clock for audio. PTP, in short, because we could go on for days about that, is simply a counter. It's a time uh, information only. There are no frequencies, there's no signals involved with it. It's just a count, since, starting since uh, January 1st on 1970. Every device in the network has to recreate its own frequencies, its own phase calculations from that. There's the concept of a PTP domain, kind of like a VLAN, but for PTP. I can only listen to people in my own domain. There's clock types, grandmasters, masters and slaves. The best master clock algorithm is a simple, not simple, it's a complicated thing that runs on every device in this kind of network. Who's the boss? Who's my source of master time? Doesn't mean it's always the grandmaster. It could be someone down below acting as the, the boss's henchman, so to speak. There's a bunch of priorities and, and parameters that are evaluated in this order specifically. Priority one some clock class accuracy and variance information. And whoever has the lowest value wins. It's unlikely that uh, it would be that way, but the lowest, the lowest values win in this case. The target is one microsecond for accuracy between, between slaves and a lock to the network within five seconds. That sounds kind of long and, and sloppy compared to what we were used to with black burst and tri-level sync, but that's the way it is. We're, we're loose in the IP world. Here's an example of those clock classes and accuracy. If I lock the GPS, my clock class is six. If I lose lock for a brief period, my clock class actually goes up to seven. I'm, I'm worse. And, and the different values are, of uh, accuracy are there too. If I haven't plugged the thing in it forever and it's never seen GPS, it may be off by minutes or seconds. That's not good enough. It takes time to bring you back into, into sync with everybody. So a lot of messages going on. I won't, I won't read this one for you. Clocks have to talk to each other, figure out what the time is, and correct for offsets and differences as much as they can. All these messages, although they are very short, you know, in the kilobits per second range, have to go into a switch fabric. And how do you send it? Well, the most common mode is multicast. That means that every message from every device goes to all the other devices. The problem is that that scales by n squared. So if you have a lot of devices, this thing is going to be overwhelmed and blow up, probably. Simply came up with an alternative called mixed mode, where the sync, uh, the delay requests and responses are sent unicast between two devices. 
so that everybody else doesn't have to hear the noise. Uh, unicast, I don't know if anybody's doing a unicast, but it is possible. In 2016, SMPTE and AES came together to say, you know, we've got some AES uh, legacy devices that only talk older versions of PTP before the SMPTE 2059 spec came along. We want them to play. So we came up with a interoperable, homogenized set of specs. The domain number, let's pick zero. The, the announce interval, once a second. The uh, timeout is three seconds. And the sync interval, eight times a second. You don't want to be lost out of sync. So Anoop's going to talk about this after me. I, I would say some general rules here. Switches in a PTP video, IP video network should be PTP aware. Preferably simply 2059. If you have a QoS policy, diff serve, the value should be set to expedited forwarding and make sure you don't have multiple paths from a master to a slave. That would be a problem. From what my colleagues have always told me, for small systems up to about 50 slaves, multicast and ordinary switches. I'm not saying you go to Best Buy and you pick it up though, but that will work in small situations. For larger systems, you need a really good switch, not just something from Best Buy, and you should be using boundary clock mode. It's like a DA for PTP. It takes in information from a grandmaster and it fans it out to a whole bunch of slaves. It takes the load off the grandmaster, for example. You could use VLANs, traditional IP VLANs, to, to isolate or segment PTP traffic. Good policy. What about the actual essences, essences themselves? Certainly you want to make sure your video packets are timed to PTP as your, your master reference time. But what if there's some jitter? The RTP timestamps that get written into the header of every packet, but the actual receive time might not be quite right. You could have some considerable variations, as in this time graph on the, the top right. You could do the same with audio, and then you could compare the two, video to audio, to see if your video is being handled in the same sort of timing as, as video. I'm not saying that that's lip sync, because lip sync could be baked in bad from the source video and the audio. Lots of implementations today have SDI to IP gateways, one way or the other. There's a lot of processing that goes on in those devices, and you want to make sure that Blackburst in your legacy SDI system is timed properly with PTP. Let's say we have two paths for dash seven redundancy. These things need to be closely aligned, just like we could have seen it as a packet interarrival histogram, two, two stock, stacked on top of each other, but you could look at them in this way too. The center is PTP is your reference, the two circles are just path one and path two. Strangely enough, when we have no vertical ancillary space, the first packet that we measure is usually delayed by, say, line 21. Uh, and people say, well, I'm off by 21 lines. No, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's okay. So here's where I fixed my typo at the last minute. Thanks. <laughs> Do you know that leaned and learned are very close, and spell check doesn't care about those? As Lee mentioned, there's a lot of interop still going on. Every deployment in the world is probably like an interop event. Vendors trying to work with other vendors, trying to figure out what's wrong and how to do it better. We, as customers and as vendors, are still trying to interpret those specs because they are new, and we're trying to uh, implement them in the best way possible. Products are evolving, frequent software updates, don't be surprised. PTP is much more complicated than Blackburst, and ironically, just a little less precise. It's kind of sloppy and things move around. Pay attention to best practices that you're going to hear about. Make sure you check your devices before you stick them in the network and go clobber somebody else's address. A couple of things to think about for the future. Are you interfacing at 10 giga gigabits per second or 25 gigabits per second? The sweet spot is always getting faster as we move in time. Core networks once was you know, a 10 gig network, now it's 40 or 100 or maybe 200 gigabits per second. Biggest one right now that I know of, and I, some people in the room are really griping about this, we need to support different audio channel configurations. Do you want one mono audio 
per multicast flow of Dash 30 audio? Do you want a group of four? Do you want a group of 16? Every vendor has its own little uh, preference, and every customer has a use case that's slightly different. I think Drew's going to talk about NMOS, Network uh, Media Open Specification, to take away that spreadsheet management thing and make interoper interoperability easier, make audio discovery and all those cool things, but progress is really slow right now. It's still manual provisioning and vendor APIs, proprietary vendor APIs, or at least do it their own way, are the fallback for controlling or addressing some other device and having them talk. What about security? You don't want somebody hacking in and taking over your, your production for some reason. My bottom line is that hybrid SDI and IP networks are going to be around in production and delivery for many years to come, certainly long past my retirement. Thank you. There's a microphone here for the, for the PA, but then Peter has a separate one that he's using for uh, the recording. The recording, of course, is available on the uh, SIMT website if you, uh, if you lost, uh, if your note taking wasn't so great, if you want to go back and take a look later, you can. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our next presenter, uh, Anoop Mehta. And Anoop is a product manager in the Data Business Center at Cisco. Uh, and he's joining us today from San Jose. He brought a jacket for our, our weather. Uh, one of the products that he's responsible for is Cisco's IP Fabric for Media Solution, which is helping customers transition from SDI Fabric to IP Fabric in their deployments, and in particular using the Nessus 9K data center switches. And other responsibilities include shaping and uh, other technologies like multipass and modularity. All the time. Well, uh, Anup, now. Thank Thanks. Thank you guys, uh, good evening. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, how to design a network for 21, uh, 2110 uh, and kind of environment. How to design a network which is scalable and highly available. Uh, what kind of, uh, you know, what are the key requirements and uh, uh, challenges that we need to take care of in designing such a network. Um, all of this, whatever I'm going to talk about, is also applicable to 2022-6 uh, as well. But I'm going to focus more on 2110 than 2022-6. So uh, I don't know why I have this picture of a switch from Cisco over here, but uh, it's just a five-port switch uh, that... Uh, uh, God was talking about probably from Best Buy, uh, which probably will not be you know uh, what you will deploy in a 2110 environment. But uh, what I wanted to convey over here is you know uh, all the 2110 endpoints you can just connect to one switch uh, over here, and you know you're good to go. They can communicate with each other, and uh, everything will work fine. But the question is, do you want to do that? Uh, will it be scalable? Will it be highly available? Uh, no, definitely not. So we uh, basically need to, you know, uh, think about all those uh, points and take them into consideration and see how we'll uh, design a network. So let's look at uh, the key requirements and challenges when you're transitioning from an SDI router to an IP fabric. Uh, so one of the things, the first thing that comes up is, you know, what kind of switches do you want to use? Do you want to use something uh, which is media specific? Probably not, because those are very expensive switches, and those uh, switches cannot be repurposed to be used for something else in your network. 
So what you want to do is actually buy something uh, uh, commercial off the shelf uh, switches, like data center grade switches in your network. So it can basically be used for uh, media broadcasting kind of environment. Also, it can be repurposed to use uh, in your IT data center as well. Right? And it's, it's less costlier to deploy such, as, such uh, switches. The other thing is uh, the network should be deterministic. What that means is uh, like the traffic ingressing a switch uh, should egress out of the switch without, uh, with zero packet loss, with minimal latency, and minimal jitter. So that is, uh, you know, uh, you need line rate uh, multicast support in the, uh, in the switches that you are going to deploy in a 2110 environment. The other one is uh, you need, um, as God talked about, uh, we need PDP support on the switches. So, uh, you know, for endpoint uh, synchronization. So make sure uh, uh, your switches support PDP. Other thing is uh, high availability. Uh, so you want to design in a way uh, that uh, uh, let's say one of your switch or one of your links uh, goes down, it should have minimum impact in, uh, on the other flows that are flowing through the network. Right? Uh, security. That is uh, probably the most uh, you know, important things that a lot of people overlook. Uh, as God said, I think uh, uh, you... Uh, you not only want to secure who accesses your systems, but also you want to secure um, the endpoints which are connected to in your network. So what if a rogue endpoint starts sending more data than it's supposed to, or an endpoint which is not supposed to, to receive some traffic is, is actually listening to that traffic, right? So you don't want that to happen. Other thing is scalability, and uh, uh, oh, the next one is uh, you know moving from SDI to an IP fabric. You don't want um, the operator workflow uh, to change, right? Uh, you still like broadcasters uh, still want to use their patch panels to do uh, you know control the system as they are used to, and moving to an IP fabric shouldn't change that. Okay, so these these are uh, the Nexus data center switches that I'm showing here. Uh, so as you can see, they come in all sorts of form factors. Uh, so one of some of them are one RUs, two RUs, uh, as well as uh, modular switches, which which can go from four slots all the way up to sixteen slots. So what what do you need to uh, like uh, you know? Uh, consider when you are deploying a switch uh, in your network for 2110. One is, the first one is, they should support line rate forwarding for both unicast and multicast. So, so what we have seen is a lot of switches can do line rate unicast, but not all of them can do line rate multicast, which is necessary for 2110. So make sure when, when you are picking a switch, that it can do line rate multicast. Also, uh, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are switches which have an oversubscription issue. So what happens is the bandwidth uh, to, uh, towards uh, the host is actually more than bandwidth towards uplinks. So what can happen over there is actually uh, there can be traffic drop. So you can actually oversubscribe your network by doing that. So you don't want that. So make sure the host bandwidth is equal to the uplink bandwidth. As you can see, the ports uh, capacity, I mean, uh, can come in different, uh, uh, like uh, it has different speeds uh, depending upon what endpoints you are connected to the switch. It can go all the way from 10 gig, uh, and now there are a couple of switches which are out which support uh, 400 gigs. Uh, other one is redundancy. So in in a modular um, uh, switch, 
you can have like two CPUs, like two supervisors. So even if one goes down, uh, the other one already has all the states, uh, and uh, it can recover from there. So it, it will have like zero or minimal impact uh, if one of the uh, supervisors go down. So this is uh, the internal like uh, uh, switch architecture. Uh, so the main part is the ASIC, which actually does all the forwarding of the packets uh, that are coming in uh, the switch. Uh, so that ASIC is the one which is actually making uh, it possible to do line rate, unicast, or multicast. Right? Not all the ASICs probably can do that. Whereas the CPU uh, is mainly uh, for control uh, plane and management plane. So for example, your PDP uh, protocol will actually run on the CPU. Uh, whereas like the video data packets which are being switched out of the uh, switches are being done by the ASIC over here. So Let's, let's look at uh, a couple of flavors of uh, 2110 endpoints, right? So there are companies which are coming out with cameras which support uh, native IP and do 2110 natively. Um, the other example is like playout systems which uh, have native IP support. Uh, and all this kind of uh, endpoints, you can actually just directly connect it to the network because they, are, they, they support IP. Uh, natively. Whereas, uh, if you look at the legacy uh, SDI endpoints, um, these endpoints um, basically need something called an IP gateway in between the endpoints and the network. These IP gateways convert an SDI signal into an IP signal. These, uh, these IP gateways act kind of uh, as a aggregator of all the SDI, uh, SDI cables. So as you can see, there are uh, six SDI cables coming in this IP gateway. And uh, there are two um, uh, Ethernet ports, A and B, which are going out and can be of any uh, port speed. So depending on the port speeds that your IP gateway supports, you will have to select a switch uh, uh, which has that port capacity. Right. So let's look at the uh, deployment options. The simplest one, as we uh, talked about earlier, is you know a single switch. It's it's the most simple. It's easy to manage because it's just one switch in your network. All the endpoints sources and the receivers are connected directly to that switch. Uh, we typically see this kind of deployment in uh, OB vans where there are space constraints. Uh, but but let's, I mean, let's look at uh, the risks of having such kind of deployments, right? It has a large failure uh, domain. So because it's a single switch, all your sources and receivers are connected to that. If the switch goes down, your whole production will go down with that. Right? Cabling becomes difficult if your endpoints are dispersed in the studio. Uh, you have to run cables all the way from all the endpoints up to this switch. And consider if you uh, want to scale up. Right? So let's say you bought a 36 port switch earlier. But now you, there are more endpoints in your network that you want to support, and you want to move to a 48-port switch. What will happen is you'll have to remove all the endpoints from this switch in a single uh, switch deployment and reconnect them to a 48-port switch. So it's, a, uh, it's like a forklift upgrade, as you can see. Right? It's not uh, easily scalable. So the most common deployment uh, we have seen with our customers as well is a spine leaf uh, architecture. In this, um, all the endpoints are connected to uh, the leaves 
uh, over here. Uh, these, the leaves are typically one RU or two RU boxes. And from them, uh, you know, you aggregate all the traffic towards the spine. And uh, then it goes back down to another leaf where the receivers are. So in this case, uh, this kind of uh, deployment, it's more scalable uh, if you want to add more endpoints in your network. So you just add one more leaf switch make a connection to both the spines from that leaf and uh, add, uh, add additional endpoints to that leaf. Right. Um, it also um, is uh, a more uh, uh, like, you know, uh, it, it's, it has a, a smaller failure domain. Uh, so just imagine if the leaf one goes down, uh, it will only affect traffic, which is was flowing through leaf one in this case, right? Or if spine one goes down, it will affect only half of what was uh, probably uh, flowing through the network. But at least the other half will still uh, keep flowing. So all, uh, this is a typical, like a modern data center design, uh, which we see in all, all the more, like financials or any, any kind of data centers that you see. The other option is the same as I mean the same as a spine leaf, but it's a hybrid hybrid spine leaf where you know some of our customers have asked to connect um, their endpoints directly to the spine, right? So in a typical spine leaf architecture, you will not connect any endpoints to the spine, only to the leaves, but you know, you may want, uh, there may be a use case where you want uh, the endpoints connected to the spine as well. So uh, what kind of bandwidth considerations uh, do you have to take in a spine leaf architecture? Because, uh, because the way the spine leaf architecture is designed, uh, you have to make sure that the bandwidth from the leaf towards the spine is greater than bandwidth of the senders on that leaf, right? So the uplink uh, from leaf to a spine should have higher bandwidth <coughs> than what you are actually trying to send uh, upstream from that leaf. Also, the bandwidth from leaves to all spines should be greater than bandwidth of receivers on that leaf. So if, one of, uh, if there are receivers on the leaf, you need to make sure that there is enough bandwidth uh, from leaf to spine to support <coughs> that kind of uh, you know, pull uh, of traffic on, uh, to, the, to those leaves. So these are the typical uh, use cases. Uh, for deployment that we have seen. So generally in a studio or a stadium uh, kind of deployment, we always see spine leaf being deployed. Whereas uh, for OB vans, we see a single switch uh, getting deployed. So uh, let's look at the, uh, the building blocks for layer three uh, IP, right? So as you can see, um, IGMP and PIM are uh, mainly the building blocks for multicast uh, in an IP fabric. PIM, uh, IGMP is the one which actually uh, receivers use to generate interest if they want to receive a particular uh, traffic or particular stream. And PIM is the one which does the routing of um, multicast uh, on the fabric. PIM actually uses internally uses uh, an IGP, uh, which is probably OSPF or ISIS or any any other uh, any kind of uh, IGP protocol uh, to actually do the routing for PIM. So, as we saw uh, earlier, uh, let's say. In a typical SDI world, uh, the broadcast controller, right, will, um, how, will the, how will the stream flow from the source to the destination? What will the broadcast controller do is 
program the cross connects in the SDI router and the stream will start uh, flowing. Right? The, whereas for, in an IP fabric uh, uh, network, the broadcast controller will actually ask the destination or the receiver to send an IGMP join uh, upstream towards the leaf to show the interest. Right? And then the fabric will actually set up the path uh, towards the source and pull traffic uh, along the way towards the receiver. So basically multicast works in a, in a pull model, as I said. It works, uh, the way it works is you receive an IGMP join from a receiver, goes to the leaf, then leaf will start, send a PIM join upstream all the way to the first stop router where the source is connected. It basically takes a path uh, along the way to reach the source. And that is the exact same path that uh, when the source starts sending traffic, it will take the exact same path to actually reach the receiver. So, so how does PIM work? So PIM has something called UCMP multipath. Uh, so what that means is uh, there can be multiple ways uh, of re reaching the source in the fabric. Right? What PIM will do is actually do an ECMP hash of all those paths and just pick one path over the other using a hash function. What that leads, what they, what that may lead to, is an oversubscription in the network. So imagine uh, all the IGMP joints that you are receiving from the uh, receiver, uh, and you are sending PIM joints upstream to reach the source. If all of them fall on the same link, right? If uh, if the hash function is such that you know it falls on the same link, you may end up oversubscribing the link. So that actually needs, uh, I mean, what the fabric actually needs here is some, some kind of bandwidth aware, uh, uh, bandwidth awareness, which will prevent oversubscription in the network. Also, uh, so as you see in 2022-6, uh, the audio, video, and ancillary are all, um, you know, a, a single signal, right? But with 2110, uh, the same signal is actually divided into video, maybe divided into eight or, you know, 14 audio signals and an ancillary signal. What that means is the multicast scale goes exponentially high when you are moving from a 2022-6 environment uh, to a 2110 environment. And you need to make sure that uh, your switch actually supports that kind of multicast scale. Generally, switches have higher unicast scale than multicast scale. So let's say you have 2,000 or so flows in, uh, uh, in your 2022-6 environment. And if you do uh, if uh, you know with 2110, if it's 16 times that, it means you are now supporting 32,000 flows in your network. So you have to make sure that your network actually can support that kind of multicast scale. So I know we talked about the benefits in in uh, you know spinely kind of architecture, but. What are the key uh, considerations that you have to take in, uh, in that kind of uh, uh, deployment? So as I said earlier, one thing is bandwidth management, right? So it is uh, with PIM ECMP, you can uh, oversubscribe the links. That way, uh, you, know, you need to have bandwidth awareness in your fabric so that uh, oversubscription is no, not a problem in your fabric. Other one is uh, network visibility. So you need to know, uh, you know what kind of flows uh, are flowing in your network, right? What are the bit rates of each flow? You, you need visibility into your network when you are in 2110. Uh, 
Another one is uh, automation. Uh, so you know you can use a network controller to automate your network um, and uh, basically do you know zero touch provisioning or you know when you're doing an RMA of a switch, it, it, it all helps with that. Uh, and the last part is like security. As, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just about who is authorized to access the network, but also uh, you know, secure the endpoints and the flows itself, uh, which are uh, you know, uh, traversing your fabric. So this is. Um, Basically, 2022-7, uh, what it involves is having two different fabrics, fabric A and fabric B. And uh, you'll have a broadcast controller which talks to both these fabrics. When you start a, sc a stream, uh, it will actually flow. So it's active-active. Both the, both the fabrics are active-active. And the stream will basically flow through fabric A as well as fabric B. And if you see the endpoints, they are actually connected to both fabric A and fabric B. That way, a receiver can actually receive the stream from both fabric A and fabric B. In this case, if uh, something happens to fabric A, some uh, link goes down or um, some switch goes down it will still keep receiving the flow from fabric B. And then, it, it uh, basically depending uh, on that, it can actually choose the best uh, stream to pick, and you will actually not lose any uh, packets in, in a 2022-7 environment. So uh, let's look at the PDB considerations here. Um, so PDB is, uh, you know, very important uh, for 2110. Um, so one of the ways to deploy PDB is, is using a transparent clock, right? But what happens with transparent clock is um, the, the endpoints are actually communicating all the way up towards the, the GM, which is the grandmaster over there. Uh, so what happens is it's, it's, uh, it creates a lot more uh, messages in the network that travels all the way towards the grandmaster, right? You, whereas you can deploy PTP in a boundary clock way where uh, you will get better scale because the leaf switch it's, uh, themselves act as a boundary clock and uh, the load on the GM is much uh, lesser than uh, the way uh, it happens in a transparent clock. So as you can see, this is a AIMS picture over here, which basically says the same uh, you know, kind of deployment that I talked about, where you have leaf A and leaf A protect, um, where that is fabric A and fabric B, and then there is a spine over there, which is connected to a PTP GM. And uh, this, is, this is what you know, uh, we have generally seen uh, all uh, our uh, customers uh, deploy. So just to summarize, uh, what, what are the important points that we need to consider in a 21 trend uh, kind of network is one of them is the ports. Uh, how many number of ports uh, or endpoints that you are connecting to your network? What kind of speeds, like what kind of uh, video? Are you sending a UHD video or a 4K video into your network? So what kind of speeds you will need? The number of flows, the number of uh, flows uh, that are flowing through the network, right? Um, do you, how do you want to scale? Do you want to have a smaller deployment at first and then scale up or, uh, you know, or you're already uh, want to deploy a, uh, like a spine leaf kind of architecture in the beginning, right? Um, then basically you, uh, use of commercial of the swell, uh, shelf uh, switches instead of you know media uh, specific switches. Um, PTP and the advantage of boundary clock uh, uh, with respect to the transparent clock and high availability with 2022-7. Uh, so 
think that's it, and I'm going to call uh, God over here. Drew. That's it. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. I have this for you. Oh, okay. oh thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Thank you. I'm going to talk slow while the microphones are, are being switched over. So our, our final speaker tonight is Drew Kakala. And uh, Drew is the principal architect uh, for Rogers Media. And uh, he has a 20-year uh, veteran of media and entertainment. He's worked for TSN, for Bell Media, for Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, Astro Media, Dome Productions, and as I mentioned earlier, he's currently with uh, Rogers Media, where he's working on the, their massive data center virtualization and hyper-converged uh, <laughs> solutions. He has hands-on experience across a wide spectrum of technologies and has developed a passion for remote production and IP workflows. Drew. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Um, how does this work? OK, good. Uh, I guess I sort of start off here uh, tonight. I'm just going to share a little bit of experience on uh, uh, video over IP with uh, the application of remote production of live events. Um, remote production is not a new concept. In fact, uh, people have been doing it for a long time. Uh, I worked at Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment in 2001, and uh, this was a picture that we took in September. Uh, some of you might know that character, that's Jeff Dwyer. Um, Jeff is lining up color bars right now, analog, uh, coming in over dark fiber. We're attached to the Air Canada Centre and we're about to do a live production about four kilometres away. In this era, we had no problems doing it because there was no IP. It was actually real easy to do a remote production over analog. We just bring the signals back in and, uh, and color correct them and uh, set the gain and equalization and away we went. But we introduced all these problems. Uh, that's my newest problem. Actually, it's starting to get a lot better. Uh, this, is our, this is our new facility that we, um, we put together uh, ju and just put online there last year. This is a remote production facility. This is an all IP facility. The monitor walls in the front, 100% IP. All of the video coming in and out of the network are IP gateways. So the, once you're inside the network, there's no more patch cable, cables. There's no, uh, there's no baseband whatsoever. So we think of it really, it's the, uh, this is the disintegration of the control room from the actual live event. And, uh, driving these sort of venues. I think our content owners want more content. We need more workflows, uh, become a little more efficient. There's even an argument that we could say we want to make higher quality content um, by getting away from some of the traditional models and into some more models similar to that. But how do you do it? There's some base requirements. Uh, first and foremost is uh, getting this latency uh, as near to zero as possible, glass to glass. So from camera lens to the output of the switcher, we're going to try to make that uh, signal propagate through there as quickly as we can and still maintain the highest picture quality. What we want to do is for the control room crew, we want them to really feel like they were actually at the live event. Um, we don't want to feel like we're 3,000 kilometers apart in some cases. So for that, we need a good transport network. Um, transport network is what we would define really as the highly reliable set of links, nodes, and paths that represent the supply chain used to produce live TV. We use this in between the control room and the actual live event. And we want to make this set of links and nodes paths to be as transparent as possible. No altering the video, no changing the audio levels, no lip sync, like slippage of signals through the network. We need to make it feel like there's no network there. And I always think of it a little bit differently. Transport's not the same as your inside plant network. When we're designing networks inside the plant, Quite often we have the luxury of maybe separating audio, video, we can put our control data on a separate set of switches, so we can bring our file transfer and our storage <laughs> networks, kind of keep them all apart. But in transport, you often don't have that luxury. We quite often combine all those traffics onto, uh, onto a singular network. So IP really has become the standard for this. I already mentioned one of the first advantages, consolidating all these traffic types onto one network. Um, I, 
IP is generally a little less expensive than some of the legacy transport technologies. And going IP, we're really leveraging the entire IT industry. Um, on the flip side of things, IP was never designed for live streaming, uh, live voice. Uh, it was, uh, you know, we're, we, we, we've introduced some challenges with these self-healing protocols, uh, with packet-sensitive applications. And as we go out to market, we start finding that not every IP network is actually created equal or with, uh, with video in mind. And finally, the, uh, the standards are still evolving, being tweaked, defined, redefined. So I always say this, if we're building a good network for, um, for, for live production and I'll, for, today's, for, the, you know, for today's topic, I'll, I'll keep it to maybe the tier one or the tier two, you know, live news, live sporting events. If you want to do a live IP production, you got to buy links that are broadcast quality. And this just means they're reliable, they're low jitter, uh, minimize bursts and queuing, and ultimately they have to be able to stand up our video traffic get it through reliably. Going out to market and purchasing these, service providers can offer you links, make sure we're buying them on service level agreements, have defined escalations, make sure that these links uh, are optimized for video. By that, I mean make sure you get into the highest QoS policy, get into that premium class. No best effort's gonna work here. Uh, we need to make sure that our packets enter the network uh, without waiting in any lines or any queues come out first. Um, or else it's going to lead to trouble. And as you know, finally, another point there, when with your service providers or whoever is offering your video links for you, make sure there's a phone number and a knock to, uh, to help you when we run into trouble. We can buy IP at all kinds of different levels. We can go cheap. We can uh, just buy public internet. Everybody's got a smartphone. We could probably do some kind of remote production over public internet right now. I mean, we'll watch Netflix and, and it works all the time, but um, you know, I look at it, we buy a cheap encoder, kind of like maybe buying a cheap car and running it across uh, Toronto, one side to another. I can't guarantee I'll make it across two days in a row at the same time. And I can't guarantee that the car is going to make it either. So there's, uh, there, there's that analogy. Whereas if we go to the, the far end of the spectrum and go to the, the dark fiber or the wavelength side, you're going to pay a little bit more, but you're buying a race car and you're putting it on a private track. And we can guarantee now our lap times each time. So you're out building a network and you, uh, you do encounter one of these, uh, these networks that's dropping packets or uh, dealing with jurist and congestion. I say get off it, don't use it, run. Um, if you have to, if you absolutely have to use this type of uh, network, use, there's tools out there such as forward error correction, uh, automatic repeat request, and um, uh, we can add buffering and stuff. But all of these techniques that we use to overcome a, a poor network either lead to higher bandwidth, with may, which may not be an option, or higher latency. Uh, which may not be an option. So if we are stuck and um, you know, there's no other choice, we're trying to tune a network, there's, uh, there's, a standards of, there's some st testing standards, RFC 2544, uh, EtherSAM test uh, Xpose developed is really good, and the Metro, Ether Forum, me sorry, Metro Ethernet Forum has a whole website and white papers and documentation to explain the standards and certifications of the telcos and service providers are using. So, um, yeah, I've been, I've been through a few bad productions. Um, the, the one that, come, that I thought I'd share tonight was, uh, it's going back about four years ago. Uh, we were dealing with, uh, I think it was an NHL broadcast, but I, I think it might have actually been several broadcasts during a, a, a week span where six o'clock would roll around and we would start seeing a uh, minor breakup uh, on, the, on, on, our, on our monitors coming in. Uh, these games were live to air and that breakup was propagating all the way to consumers. Um, eight o'clock rolls around, the breakup's getting so bad that the presidents of our various companies are now calling in to, uh, to find out. This would get progressively better, like around 10 o'clock, it would start disappearing, and then midnight it would, uh, it would completely uh, disappear. Um, this pattern repeated over, over several nights. In the meantime, we're building baseband uh, pathways to get off our IP links to buy us some time to troubleshoot. 
Uh, it turned out that in, these, in this instance, uh, this packet loss um, scenario was actually caused by our, one of the, the main broadcasters who was covering the Olympics that year released an app. Um, you could download it on every uh, iPad, iPhone, device, tablet, and stream your own Olympics, do it video on demand style. So that video on demand Olympics that people were doing at home in their living room was actually congesting the carriers, um, uh, the service providers' core networks. Us being a premium customer should never have been effective, but what was happening is our packets entered the edge of the carrier network and then eventually into the core, worked their way across the country, came back out at the other end. Quality of service wasn't mapping properly from uh, two manufacturers of switches. End to end, six months to fully troubleshoot and resolve. Um, had to involve putting new firmware into every single switch in the carrier's core. Uh, and Edge to fully resolve and two major manufacturers to even uh, recognize. And uh, one last point there is, uh, I think with our use case, we bring problems forward that other users and regular maybe uh, IP applications might never even see. So we're, we're really the ones who are pushing uh, a lot of this uh, technology to its max. I already said it, picture breakup, these are all just side effects, audio dropouts, etc. Worst case would be a total signal loss. And so in reality, uh, it doesn't matter how good you build a network when, uh, when the fiber is cut. And there's all kinds of things that cause it, car accidents, road repairs, a good old backhoe, and uh, just most recently here, train derailment. This is less than one month old. This is just an example I was able to, uh, to pull up most recent. CBC covered a good story here. A train derails, um, several cars leak oil, remediation crews go out, they clean up the oil. What the story doesn't cover is that train derailment right there took out one of our main fiber optic trunk cables going across Canada and uh, took our, our, our splicing crews four days to just build a temporary splice to bring that, uh, that service back on. Um, the good part was, though, the, guy, the, the, the team that was cutting the news at that exact moment didn't even know this happened. Nobody at home knew it happened. We didn't drop a single frame of video because of uh, the protection that we built into our transport. So designing a, uh, a, a network, um, I, say, I state here, as network architects, engineers, et cetera, it's our job to make networks as transparent as possible. And by this, simply philosophically, I think the easiest thing to, way to think of it is mimic the baseband cable. Um, every one that goes into the network comes out as a one, every zero comes out as a zero, and, um, and, and go to SMPTE. 2022 suite of standards, 2110 uh, suite there are, are there for us to, uh, to build upon. So, 2022-6, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple things on it. Number one is if you were to ask me tomorrow if you want to build a transport network and do something coast to coast, uh, I would definitely, without hesitation, uh, tell anybody today that 2022-6 is a good way to do it. It works, it's established, embodies SDI. Uh, you take it one step further, add the hitless merge, uh, the dual path protection, and that, by the way, is how we survived the, uh, the train derailment earlier this month. Um, on the downside, though, uh, 2026, uh, especially in the end, like because we're talking uncompressed here, is going to chew up a ton of bandwidth, and we can't send that audio and video separately as a, um, or break it up inside the network. We send it everywhere. So if we want to break up the audio and video, this is where 2110 starts coming in, and. Um, lots of folks are building 2110 inside of plants right now, but the new thing is going to be let's take 2110 and build it across a WAN. Uh, this is where things definitely are heading. I haven't seen it in use widely anywhere, but I know a lot of folks are testing, including uh, us at Rogers. We'll be doing some tests this year on 2110 uh, over the WAN. So it's going to be exciting. We'll see how this develops. Uh, one of the, I guess I should throw it there, it's the challenge there with 2110 is going to be keeping PTP together uh, over, over multiple hops and multiple telcos potentially. So uh, today uh, we can go out and buy 1 gig or 10 gig links very easily from our service providers. 
Uh, 10 gig I would consider to be the sweet spot. You can pretty much go into almost any major city, any major venue and order up a, a 10 gig wavelength or uh, ethernet connection. That 10 gig though will only support six uncompressed video streams, which might not be enough if you have an eight camera shoot and you need to send some audio with it. So um, compression comes into play and JPEG 2000, running at about 150 megabits per second is going to buy a 65 uh, video feeds on that same link. So we used to compression a lot today. Compression isn't necessarily a bad thing. There's lots of, um, lots of excellent codecs to choose from. I've listed a few. I kept the MPEG codecs out because I think for this tier one, tier two, sports, live sports, live news stuff, that uh, keeping with the really low latency codecs is, uh, is, is probably the best place to do it. Uh, JPEG XS is new. Um, if we run 1080 progressive at 60 frames per second, we can achieve visually lossless picture quality at uh, 150 megabits per second, which is, uh, which is a nice, uh, nice spot there. A little bit higher than standard J2K, but far less than baseband. Uh, they, the real shine here, though, is on the um, uh, latency side. We're looking at three to five lines of latency, so we're approaching uncompressed. Uh, while still compressing. So that's a pretty strong, you have to have a pretty strong argument to build a, a long haul transport network in the uncompressed domain when, uh, when these good codecs are available. Here's, um, here's the model that we use to build out in Rogers. Uh, this was a whiteboard that kind of turned into uh, a model that we scaled out across the country. We say we want to support any studio, um, any truck, any venue, and marry it into any control room, any production center, production hub. And so we kind of came up with this model, and really this is a, a templatable, this is a scale-out model. You can add another studio by copying, pasting, and dropping the new nodes on the network with new IPs. We can do that. Uh, we can add studios, control rooms very quickly. If we just need to add cameras, we can just add more video gateways. Same thing with audio or any other gateway. We can scale out a show to match a... Uh, the requirements of it, but inside of the middle is still that IP network, and 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 this is a little bit trickier. It's um, misrepresented as a square box. There, it's going to be more like one of these. Uh, if you're building in plant, or maybe you're building a smaller Metro Connect type of uh, transport network across town, Leaf and Spine, or Hub and Spoke are are, are are great options. Simple ways to to build out, but uh, as we get into countries like Canada, United States, larger geographic areas, it's gonna be more likely and more economical to build a meshed style of network where your production hub might be in the middle and all your cities are interconnected uh, through, uh, through, through closer links. The problem with meshed is that we're building a blocking uh, architecture. And by blocking, I don't mean switches that block. I'd assume in, in this level of network, everything's gonna be non-blocking. I'm talking about uh, network design that introduces the blocking. So this example here, uh, we have three remote sites. Um, they're all aggregating into a uh, production hub. Each remote site, 10 gigabits per second, gives us an aggregate of 30. And, and if I used our city TV news example, where we're producing news inside of Rogers across three cities, we've got Winnipeg, we've got uh, Edmonton, and we've got Vancouver. We don't run news at the exact same time uh, in each city. In fact, at the top of the hour, we shut down Winnipeg and we move to Edmonton. Top of the hour, we shut Edmonton down, we move into Vancouver. That way, we're only ever putting 10 gigs on the, uh, at the aggregation point going into the hub, and we never oversubscribe the bandwidth. And the only way we can do that, really, is to, uh, is to pull, is to do this through the software-defined networking and the scheduling interface. So. Uh, anytime you're thinking of a transport network, it's again, I said earlier, uh, transport network not the same as inside plant. If you're, your inside plant network will have router panels and everything's usually a hot route, we don't worry about bandwidth. But in transport, because of that blocking uh, scenario I showed you, it's important that when we route, we build the start times and end times. So instead of routing, it's scheduling. And we build out interfaces that we can share with um, different people within the organization, perhaps non-technical people, can schedule their own bandwidth. And um, 
yeah, I, I, I like to think of it, it's this whole thing, this whole transport world is nothing short, it's nothing more than advanced reservation of bandwidth and careful bandwidth planning. Underneath all that planning, you need a way to visualize uh, what's happening. Uh, everybody who's uh, charged with supporting, managing, controlling the network needs some kind of a tool. So this is where your network management system comes into play. This is a screenshot from ours. Um, but they all kind of do the similar thing. What we're trying to do is uh, prioritize alerts and alarms that come up. We'll use the color red for something that's really uh, uh, problematic in the network, like a fiber cut or a major piece of equipment that fails. If something is in between, it might be yellow, and peer informational alerts will bring up as white. But as the network grows, the more traffic we put on it, the more shows we start doing, the more data we're, 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 we're starting to collect. I get into the next part here, which is really data collection. And we talk about troubleshooting an IP. And I actually say the fundamental way of troubleshooting an IP is actually just da simply data collecting. All we need to do is uh, make sure every device that goes on the network gets an accurate time of day set and, uh, and gather its logs. Send all those logs to, um, to, stri tri uh, to strategic points on the network so we collect them and in the event of a uh, network outage or equipment outage, what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out exactly you know, from, uh, from the people who were at the, at, at the event, know exactly what time the issue was, and then we start pulling all these other logs forward and correlate, we line all the logs up at the exact time, and we start developing the story and understanding exactly what happened inside the network that would have caused, uh, caused the issue. But uh, something I, I, worth considering for everybody is like, can we turn the log levels up? I wanna, I'd like to see us inside our network start turning the log settings to 11, gather more information than we, uh, we ever think we might need, because you never know in storing it for a period of time. But you know, asking a couple operators to look at that much data is gonna start becoming really cumbersome. It's gonna become too much data. And so we're gonna start needing some new tricks to, uh, to parse all this out. And this is where um, machine learning and AI start coming into play. We can start uh, trending all of these logs, all this information, and, uh, and look for the anomalies. But I, 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 an example of where we might actually try this out, um, imagine an SFP, uh, a laser that's shooting light, uh, starts to decay on us. It, you know, before we actually go off air, uh, 21 days earlier, you know, the, the straight line started to take a dipwards down, and uh, that was nothing more than the light level. But we didn't even know this was happening until the 21st day, because that's when we went off air. We opened up the logs, and we realized, okay, yeah, there it is, 21 days earlier, I can see what was happening, and I had 21 days to solve the issue. If we had a, uh, and this is a very basic example of, 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 of uh, anomaly detection, but if we had a met method to see that dip 21 days earlier, that would have given us enough time to open up a maintenance window, ship out a spare SFP, get it installed, and do it uh, without anybody, without actually going off air. So the, the bottom line here is we want to start preventing problems before they happen. Um, more on the future forward side is the idea of IP to IP handoffs. I, it's, a, it's a bit of a frustration or a pain point to me that we still go out of our way to hand off signals in, in SDI when we're going from carrier to carrier or from uh, transport network to transport network or transport to implant. The, the days come now where everything should be handed off in the IP domain. Uh, we want to get away from de-encapsulating and re-encapsulating, adding additional complexities. What we want to do is preserve all those R RTP timestamps, uh, support the 2022-7 protection, and, and, and this is really an enabler to some of the next-gen uh, uh, stuff. Um, this new shift to 4K and is 8K coming out, 16K, I don't know where, where we're going to stop. I really don't care because all of those are just bandwidth uh, calculations. Uh, more, more resolution, uh, especially in the uncompressed domain, would just add more bandwidth to it. So uh, demand is here. It's supporting something like Olympics or anything large scale. We're going to need, um, we're gonna need 100 gig links. Uh, the only issue there is 100 gig is not uh, widely available. You can't just go out to any service provider and order it tomorrow. So um, just have to have the right use case, I suppose, to, uh, to, to justify it. 
But as we get into the 100 gig links, if you are going out and spending the premium dollar and putting 100 gig between two sites, I don't expect you're uh, going to have a budget left over to go buy 1 gig links for audio and, and 10 gig links for file and control. I think it's all going to end up on the same, uh, the same network. So isolating the bandwidth inside of the network and uh, smart design is crucial. So finally, it's this notion that everything's going into the cloud. Today, we consume content differently. We have smartphones, we've got laptops, uh, we have new uh, smart TVs, etc. And a lot of these streams are coming into us from data centers, not from traditional digital television. So why are we sending feeds back to a broadcast facility and cutting, cutting shows traditionally? Maybe we should start thinking about sending our content directly into a data center. And I, I, this is all future stuff, and, and you, can, you can laugh me off the stage, but I think the, um, you know, the concept here of virtualizing uh, devices sort of typically being hardware, anything from production switchers, audio mixing, graphics, replay, it's all gonna be quite doable. And uh, this is a trend that as us, we broadcasters, we really need to learn to embrace and enable it. Or uh, the, the scary part is somebody else could figure it out before us. Um, just wanted to acknowledge some of the groups that are figuring out these next-gen transport technologies. There's, uh, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of active forums. There's white papers. There's um, meetings that are held regularly, and, and, and they're always open for new members. So pack, personal pack to myself is to get quite a bit more engaged in some of these groups and encourage other people, too. So that's, uh, that was my last slide. Thank you. And I'll... Okay.